Recording in progress. already started our meeting this, or this morning, this, this evening, and we're going to pick up on item six, the Board of Education spotlight on the agenda. All right, so we are very excited this evening to be recognizing uh, three students for the S-P-E-L-L-I-N-G space B-E-E. <laughs> are you a good job? I was nervous. <laughs> No, on a serious note, we are. I, I don't know how you three do this. It's unbelievable. Um, so congratulations. So on behalf of the Board of Education, the district leadership team, we're going to be recognizing three students, Liam Becker, Walid Nassar, and Lillian Piatkowski, who all advanced to the oral uh, round of the post-standard Syracuse.com regional spelling bee held on February 4th. Liam is a fourth grader at Reynolds Elementary School. Walid is a sixth grader at Ray Middle School, and Lillian is a fifth grader at Van Buren Elementary School. Um, these students won their school spelling bees and competed in the online regional round to qualify for the local final round. Uh, so again, congratulations. So what we're gonna do at this time is we're going to have board member Tanya rosado Berenger, and I will uh, present the certificates of achievement to our three students. Come on down. Come on down. a few questions. <laughs> You've probably been asked this about a hundred times, right? What was the word? What was the word that ended it? Uh, during the, do you remember the word that you weren't able to spell? It's okay if you don't remember. Prone. What was it? Go ahead. Prone. Say it. Um, prone. prone. You know it now though, right? I'm not going to test you. What about you, Willie? I don't even know what that is. Escapade. Escapade. Okay. All right. I guarantee you, though, next year you're gonna you're gonna remember those words, right? All right. Again, on behalf of the district, congratulations. Outstanding job. on the agenda is the Correspondence Board Activities and Committee Reports. And on February 15th, we had a Board of Education building visit to Baker High School. I can jump in. Um, I was able to attend. Um, we had a great tour with um, Jen Turpening and um, some other board members. Um, it's always a pleasure to see buildings that you as a board member, you're not in with your students or your own children. Um, um, we start off on the bottom or on the first floor of the tech department, the auto shop. is always fascinating to me is what these kids do and the teachers there to get them involved. Um, also, it was exciting to see, um, we hear a lot about it, um, and I'm not naming, I'm not calling it correctly, so maybe Zion can help me out, uh, the food pantry. Um, but the, the beef bowl, yes. Um, we got to see that in action and they were boxing things up and learned a little bit more about that. So that was pretty pretty um, interesting. Um, and then uh, we were shown the, the pool and the gym area 
uh, about potential or the future projects coming forward. Um, so that was good to see it um, firsthand or understand what things might be firsthand. Yeah, I'd say my, uh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, my only regret is we spent so much time with the uh, teachers that we did get to see that we uh, we didn't get quite to the back of the building. So hopefully next year we'll uh, swing by the back of the building first and see all the music department stuff. But everything we spent was great, and that's why the uh, conversations went along and we got to see some neat stuff. So thank you to everybody who set that up. We also got to see the uh, boutique, and I don't remember the name of the people, which was um, really nice to see that they have for the students. It was also pretty cool to, well, besides the really long hallways, uh, probably the really long shoes, and um, the other thing was just also to be able to see, to visualize the projects, that the facilities, presentation, proposal, consideration, areas of the building, I thought that was rather fascinating. So you know, going to the pool area and seeing the changes, potential changes, was pretty remarkable. So thank you. It was a great visit. And just to say everything that everyone else has already said, it was great. Um, there was apparently a wing in the building I had never been to, so that was exciting. I didn't know we had a wrestling room. That was cool. Um, yeah, but I agree. I wish we got to, got to make it to the music departments because that's a, a great area to visit, so we'll have to start there next year. Um, but I thought the library had a lot of great things um, with the Baker News and all that other kind of stuff and just the ideas that they have going forward just to offer um, more things for our students. The weight room was really cool with a bunch of updates and then just, you know, like everyone else already said, just kind of visualizing the, the capital project and how great that's going to be. It was a great visit. I feel my board colleagues hit all of my like, check, check, check. So well done, team. Um, Dr. DeBarber, did you want to say anything? I was just going to say to the families, uh, you're more than welcome to stay. Um, you don't have to stay. That was the portion of the meeting that we wanted to recognize your your children for the outstanding accomplishments. So if you feel like you want to leave, you can leave. You can stay if you'd like. It's, it's totally your call. <laughs> I'm going to go because I need to go to New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please do not feel bad. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations again. On February 16th, we had a special board of education meeting to talk about a personnel issue, and then on February 21st, we had another special education meet or special special board of education meeting, and appointed Dr. De Joseph Devarvi as our next district superintendent, effective on July 1st, 2023. And then on March 1st, there's a DEI committee meeting. I can start since I had to leave early. Um, the, um, the folks put on the uh, informative meeting, the uh, the structure of the DEI meetings, the first half of the meeting is, is more kind of instructional, collaborative, um, and then the second half of the meeting is, is more of a work session. It's split up uh, by different areas, so the different buildings sit together, the community sit together so that they can focus on the um, the area and the goals that kind of affect them. Um, some, there's some kind of activities in terms of identity. Um, let's see, the, I don't know, what am I doing? I'm missing a lot. But. No, like Matt said, we focused on identity. There was an identity wheel that we used. Uh, brought up a lot of interesting conversations. Also, we had, um, there was, let's see, it's called the Four Diverse Environments and Experiences um, with integrated, included, excluded, and segregated, and how people feel in, in different situations. Uh, we brought up a lot of different, I guess, equity issues in the community. And then, like Matt said, he had to leave at the end of the first part. Um, but the second part was great. Uh, we met in the other room and had a bunch of people from the community just discussing on ways to, to kind of get, I guess, the message heard more so about DEI and getting more people involved, whether it's a book club or 
you know, someone brought up uh, an idea for like a Halloween costume drive and a bunch of other uh, really exciting things. Tony was there um, kind of remediating it or mediating it or whatever, um, you know, taking down those ideas and we're looking to get more people involved uh, within the community and to, to, to join the committee as well. So it was really, really good. So there's actually a survey that went out today to all the DEI committee members. They're um, looking for feedback. Uh, they have until Friday, March 17th to complete that survey and then that will help drive uh, part of the instruction for their final meeting of this year, uh, which will be on May 31st. Um, yeah, I forgot. There's one topic that you know kind of repeatedly comes up, and that's the name of the committee. It's DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's you know feelings that it should be DEIB. I've heard DEIJ. You know, so uh, B would be belonging. J, J would be justice. So you know, I understand those concerns. Um, I don't have any answers for that, but I did want to acknowledge that some of those concerns were brought up. The other one was A for accountability. Right. Yeah. So yeah, good conversations. And then on March 3rd, we had a wellness committee meeting. Um, Kristen, um, but talked about um, our district nurse joining our committee, Katie Kazuli, I believe is her name. Um, she also said that the WellSat um, interview questions were finished and they will be reviewed and the feedback will be used for implementing um, our wellness policy and, and um, be used to create goals for that. Um, also, a couple of the schools are planning wellness days. Um, some are in the works right now and some are putting them off till the nice weather comes. Most of the schools have wellness clubs, um, the elementary I believe, and um, she had also talked about um, doing a staff inquiry for, um, to gauge the wellness of the staff. Um, it's been done I think the past couple of years and that is going to be continued. And um, she's also looking for um, wellness news articles, get that to her for March 23rd, that would be appreciated. And she's going to start Mindful March, I believe next week, 21 day March challenge. Um, just um, some videos, some one minute, maybe cute little pictures, just to take some time for yourself and challenge yourself just to relax a little bit. And um, let's see, there's a problem. Um, we, we talked about the um, food service, the farm to school program, and Donna is working on getting that. Um, so that we will have a, a well, or farm to school Thursdays, and then hopefully in September, we will have it um, maybe once a month. And let's see, there's also an action um, for Healthy Kids grant, and if you need information on that, I'll contact Kristen, and she will you can go to Action for Healthy Kids, and she will help you with the application for that. Hit everything that I have. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> it was a good meeting. I have to say, well done, like check, check, check. Nice job, thank you. We have some upcoming meetings um, up there for everyone to get on their calendars. We have some building tours. These building tours are going to be for the facilities part of the visitation committee, which, as I'm sitting here looking at this, we canceled the Derby instructional visit, and we can get a reminder to see if we can get that rescheduled sometime in the we can make no I just I yeah I just thought of it um, looking at these building tours and does anyone have anything else they'd like to report on that they've attended recently um, we, okay just real quick um, I just wanted to say I've enjoyed um, over the last month um, just viewing and, and attending the, the winter guard the color guard events at the various school sites across the region ESN and more recently 
somewhere in Saturday and Reno, I can't remember. Um, darn it, where was it? CNS. Yes. 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 thank you. Um, and I have to say, it was pretty awesome just watching um, the B. Melgardies, the ERA, um, junior, junior varsity, and, and the varsity um, teams. It was great. It was also great to learn from the judges in the last session just how the process goes and what to expect. And um, just so proud of the teams for always, always seeing it through to the end um, and always smiling. So it was great to watch. So enjoy it. Thank you for sharing that, Tanya. Um, I just want to up uh, there. There was the Ray and Derby band concert last or Wednesday or Thursday, I'm sorry. Um, but it, it was great. Um, great performances by both bands, the Ray and Derby, and then the pep band played afterwards, which was really great. I had never seen them perform, like sitting and watching them. Wow, a lot of energy. It was a lot of fun. They definitely get you moving. And also what I found interesting was there was there were staff um, teachers who are also participate in uh, the pep band, so it was just a lot of fun. The pep band every year put on a great concert on uh, Paper Mill Island in June. It's usually towards the end of the year and it's like a really long one, like an hour and a half if not more. Um, I would suggest everyone go see it. It's pretty amazing. Um, but I was going to talk about basketball, so I hope I'm not jumping on your toes because you went to more games than I did. Um, but I went to the game at West Jenny. I was a little late when we got there for the second half. But the showing from our students and community was crazy. Like, it was a home game for West Jenny, but um, I think our, our fans were louder than theirs. Um, and they were probably, you know, two-thirds of the arena, but our, our little one-third was very loud and proud, so it made me very proud to be there. If I could chime in, speaking of West Tennessee, uh, so both from the basketball game and the ice hockey game, unfortunately we didn't come out on top for the Section 3 championship, but I did receive a phone call from the superintendent at West Tennessee the next day, and he said regardless he was going to call. He's been impressed with just the sportsmanship and the way that our district and students carry themselves. And he said, win or lose, yes, they were on top, at least in uh, both games, but he said he would have made that phone call either way. So that speaks to our coaches, to our spectators, to our student athletes. Um, what matters most, win or lose, is that you're going to be a good sport and you're going to do what you need to do. And, and they certainly represented our district well. Can't be more proud of them for that. Okay, the last thing I'm going to add is um, I this Friday uh, is uh, Mid-State Arborns at OCM BOCES um, celebration of the Syracuse delegation uh, for the Puerto Rican Hispanic Youth Leadership Institute. It will be held at the Double Tree Hotel and I do know several members of the cabinet will be attending and, and we have 27 delegates who participated in this year's Leadership Institute including um, three members from Beville, and I wanted to make sure I highlighted them because I have my list here, and I'm going there. It's Isabella <coughs> Beck. Oh my gosh, hold on, I want to make sure. We have Sophia Beck, Isabella Clark, and we have Sydney McKinney. So I wanted to make sure um, they were recognized as well, so I'm really proud of them. So, any issues there, those of you who are coming, thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else for this portion of the meeting? Okay, next up on the agenda is a student board report. So Azan will share with us what's been happening across the district. It's okay, I just like, sabotage my entire like, every single, like every, okay, but it's fine. I'm not going to do the personal Okay, so, well, I guess I was going to, like, I saw you guys wandering around Baker study halls it was uh, okay but it's just been interesting like watching the kids walk into the building and like look at the posters that are all around the building and be like oh my god wait that looks really cool just like the future plans so yeah I guess from a student because it's also been it's just been entertaining to watch the reactions um anyway um the boutique I guess the I guess the actual title that is Mrs. McRobbie's Be Beautiful Boutique um but I've mentioned that we've done fundraisers and like competitions among first period classes, so we're doing one for this whole month. 
um, first period classes are competing to bring in clothes for the boutique. So I've, there's already a fair bit of competition between my first period class and another first period class, just like there was last time. So that should go pretty well again. Um, I guess I talked about the marching band, talked about swim, um, indoor track had their Okay, well then swim. Okay, so boys swim had some athletes that went to states and they brought them an award. I think I don't want to get the place wrong. They got an award. That's the important part. Um, and then boys four by four indoor track team placed fifth at the federations this weekend. There was quite a few kids that went. I know that they all had a good time. Whether they necessarily got the awards that they wanted to or not, it was enjoyable. You guys talked about the hockey game and just talking about some of the kids that were there. I mean, even if we didn't win necessarily, the student section was I mean, they always turn up to hockey games, but um, that was an entertaining one. Um, I think someone might have mentioned, but the grade six, 12 art show starts tomorrow. And then it, it was last Thursday was the Derby Ray concert, the band concert. Um, Little Women um, is starting, I think. Thursday. Thursday, Friday, and then I think they're doing Saturday. a show. Saturday, they're doing a show as well. Yeah. So that'll be exciting. I think the students get to watch it, if I'm not mistaken, too, so I'm actually kind of looking forward to that. Um, spring sports, sports are right around the corner, obviously with winter sports just closing, which is kind of crazy, because like last Friday was five weeks already, so there's only like 15 weeks left of school, and that hit me the other day. I was actually like sitting at work, and one of my coworkers was like, hang on, your school year is almost over, so I've been talking all year long about how quickly it's been going by, but yeah, there's 15 weeks left, which is like exciting, but also kind of scary. Uh, anyway, uh, Eldon, Mr. Coughlin was, I don't know if I fully got the memo, but I think I, okay, so he said that when students are found to be practicing the three Bs, which are respect, responsibility, and safety, they earn a three Bs ticket. Once they've won five tickets, they're able to trade in the ticket for a gold coin, which can be used towards a free book. The other half of their ticket goes into a hat, and at the end of the month, a random ticket is drawn, and the students, I think it's more of a group of students, get to sit at the golden table during lunch. I can imagine for an elementary group of students, it's exciting, and yeah. And then for Ray, um, I don't want to get this wrong, but I think I've got it. So the agri from what I understand from the email, the Agricultural Club has been working on process, or like, uh, collecting sap from maple trees around the campus, and they are boiling it down and using the data to help increase efficiency and uh, eventually they're going to compete, I guess what it sounds like, I think, is they're gonna compete with other schools and they'll be evaluated on four criteria going, going up against other schools across New York State. So I also hope they do well. That sounds like an experience. Um, I didn't know they had an agricultural club, so that's also exciting. Um, yeah, you guys stole everything else, so. Okay, exciting. Yeah, I don't know. I guess just the main thing is I do my home screen sports are going to start, so that'll be exciting. And the year is very quickly coming to close. So, do we know that. what the, the perks are of sitting at the golden table? Do they get their food brought to them or any extra? I don't know if he's still out there. Is he? Okay. They, they get special plates. You're going to see a picture in a few oh. moments. Oh, spoiler alert. Just coincidentally, the golden table. Perfect. Now the instructional one. budget presentation. And then, uh, Azan, I don't know if you mentioned, because you kind of brought up marching band type stuff, uh, but this Saturday is the St. Patrick's Day Parade. I think it starts at 10, but I don't know for sure. So. Also with the marching band, they've been in the Sammies for a while. I don't know how far they've needed exactly. They, they lost. Well, they did pretty well. I mean, they yeah. did well. They were so the, one of the finals. That was also too. something that I wanted to mention, sure. how far they've needed. They always do well. Thank you. Next up, we have public participation. Can we have speakers tonight? Okay, moving on to item nine, the consent agenda. Result of the Board of Education approve the consent agenda pursuant to the attached. Can I have a motion, please? Shelley first. Second. Second, Tanya. Any questions or discussion? Um, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes 8-0. Next up on the agenda is the report section, so Dr. Garbery will lead us through that portion of the meeting. 
So we have uh, first the uh, facilities, Rick Foderer. I believe there was just a minor change related to BOCES costs because uh, we finalized our BOCES service requests. So Rick will tell us what those changes are. And if you have any further questions, the floor is open to them. Uh, like Dr. DeBarbery said, uh, the last page of the presentation before the pictures. Uh, we just got the final service request numbers released from BOCES, so those uh, changes are reflected on that slide. Does anyone have questions regarding the facilities budget? Hearing none, thank you, Rick. Thank you. Next, we have R.J. Delisle, and again, there were some changes there based on BOCES. So I will pull that presentation up. R.J. Which page would you like me to go to, R.J.? Just the last one. The last one. Nope. That's the only change. And I'll let you ask me questions if you have any on, on that page. You're going to also see after the instructional budget presentation in a few moments, all of the changes, um, they were attached as an upload. If there was a change made. So we can pull that up too if you'd like to see that later on. Anybody have any questions for RJ? Any surprises with the changes? Were they in our favor or not in our favor? No, they were. It, it pretty much works out as a wash. And like the last time I said, the, a major change was moving the, the lease payments over to debt service, so it makes it look like my budget went down, but it just got kicked to somebody else's. Thank you, RJ. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we will move on to the uh, general fund instructional budget. So this will be the first reading, and I will walk you through uh, some of the changes. So we'll first begin here with this, this slide, um, just to point out, based on the conversation earlier, there's the golden table. So it is an exciting thing for Eldon and uh, students and, and their teachers to be able to participate. Um, you'll see an example of a picture here to kind of highlight the joint effort with our um, wind ensemble and our, excuse me, our strings program and our um, instrumental band program here from a concert recently at Baker High School. There's a photograph here of our students in the UPK program, some technology or STEM related uh, to highlight some of the CTE work that's being done across the district. And the reason that I am utilizing these photographs, um, because what you're going to see or hear this evening uh, when it comes to our um, instructional budget is um, some additional positions that have been built in this year uh, to enhance our programming across the district and also to um, support some of the, the programs and the personnel that have been added over the last two years that we've been funding through the American Rescue uh, Plan and the, um, the SIRSA funding that we've received from the federal government. So you're going to see some shifts in the instructional budget to make sure that we can sustain those so the general fund, fund budget is going up. Um, luckily for us, there's a balancing act with the uh, funding that we're receiving. Obviously, there's an increase, and we'll talk more about that later. But just to highlight some of the changes that have been built into this budget as opposed to the current 22-23 budget, we have one nurse floater. We have clerical support in our elementary buildings. We have the increase with assistant principals uh, in our secondary buildings moving to 12 months. We have the five SRPOs that were added in this current year's. Um, we have one ENL teacher addition compared to the current budget. We have the embedding of three learning coaches that were supported through other funding. We have one additional CTE teacher. We have four elementary school counselors. We have one APE physical education and health teacher. 
And then on the areas of uh, extracurricular and support, we have um, additional funding and personnel for uh, the musical being embedded in this budget. The, um, we're looking at creating a, a play, so it will be a drama production, a play with play personnel, um, advisors, and then uh, regarding marching band, uh, Winter Guard, et cetera, there's some additional uh, personnel. Um, but the big one would be uh, the parade band. So currently, you know, we do have students participating in parade band, but the advisors and the uh, program coordinators do that work based on their stipend that they receive for the marching band season, the field band season, which happens at the beginning of the, of the school year in the fall. And they're really doing a lot of this work that they've done over the course of um, the last couple of years, really at, at, at their own you know, love of, of doing this work with students. So we have embedded in additional personnel so that we can have a parade band staff to make it equitable across, uh, similar to the fall, spring, and winter uh, coaches that we approve through the athletics end. Um, we're able to do that, and I'll show you where that's coming out of, um, because you're not gonna see a significant increase in the dollar amount budget to budget, but what we're able to do is we're supporting some of that work through the arts and ed account, through Oswego BOCES, which will eventually shift to OCM BOCES, um, so we can generate aid. So it's allowing us to hire more um, staff to support student programming. Can I make a request on this? Yes. In the future of this type of presentation, could you, at the beginning, just give us a summary of the new additions to the budget? You don't have to get into the meat and potatoes, but just a summary, so it's just easily readily available for us to look at as you're going through the process and explaining why it's easier to reference. We can certainly do that. We've uh, debated back and forth but we can, we can update the presentation so that these are listed there. And it will be in the budget newsletter and it will be in the budget okay. uh, presentation so that folks see the specifics of what we're adding. Thank you. Well, and I think um, going forward next year too, Dr. Davis has been talking to us a lot at the cabinet level and Tiffany and I as well in regards to maybe changing how we present some of this information next year um, in regards to even what we're getting into now, so it's a little more meaningful. I think what's happened over the years is we've had to break out the budget lines to such a granular level that it then creates more questions, like we've already talked about, like a psychologist line, there might be one person and somebody retires, and maybe do more of, um, I'm gonna say a rolled up, like for those areas, but yet be able to provide you with detail in the weekly letter. So if you wanna see each line item, but I, I mean, in looking for kind of input and discussion, but that's kind of what I've been used to in other districts, and I think Tiffany as well, and, and Dr. Davis. So we definitely would like to revamp the budget discussion. So thank you for bringing that forward. Yeah, the, the volume of information presented, you get lost in it. So um, I find it's useful if we present it by, in the three-part format, and cluster um, the areas so that we can have some more meaningful conversations on those ads and any deletions if there were any. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so as you take a look at this first uh, or second slide here with the overall, you'll see a budget to budget increase of about $5.1, $5.2 million, which is approximately 11% increase. Um, it seems significant, but again, given funding and, and, and embedding some of the costs that we're currently supporting through um, other uh, funding sources, you know, putting it all in perspective, this is what matters most. It's the instructional, um, it, it's the, you know, the contact, the experiences that students uh, have in our schools. There's the overall, and we'll talk more about that at the end, um, but as we take a look, um, like I said, the majority of the instructional positions here, you're not going to see significant changes other than contractual. Um, part of this is because when we had um, retirements and based on some of the additional personnel that we're adding, for example, if we're adding an APE teacher, if it happens to be the APE teacher at the elementary level, that um, FTE is split over all of the elementary buildings if they're in those buildings. So you're not going to see something stand out like you would in, in, in other budgets. Um, prior years. Um, the one thing I will point out, um, 
you see an increase at Reynolds grade four or five. Looks pretty significant here. Um, but that's just based on the shifting of personnel based on their current salaries. Uh, there were some shifts within the building. And we also have an additional position uh, moving up um, based on enrollment compared to the prior school year. Please stop me if you have any um, specific questions. Any, anything on, on salaries? At least for the teaching staff. I'll point out Baker administration. You'll see that that is going up. That is because they were the final, if you remember what we negotiated last year with the administrators, that is the final group of assistant principals that will shift to 12 months. So you'll see it increase because of that work. And then you'll see an increase in learning coaches. Again, we were supporting the learning coaches through a lot of our funding, through title funding and ARP. We're building that into the budget um, so that we can continue the professional development um, through the general fund. If we still have some additional resources with title funding, um, then that'll just be fund balance that we've built into the budget. Any questions with the teaching assistants or TAs? Substitutes, this is gonna fluctuate from year to year based on the number of who, who ends up uh, needing a substitute. Same thing with home instruction. It's not like it was a few years back where we could have one budget line and it made more sense and you could see how things changed. Now we have to fluctuate based on who's actually um, in, those, in those roles, who's taking, taking the time. And then last but not least, you'll see some slight increases with the extracurricular clubs. But again, we're trying to use most of the arts and ed funding. So as I just described, the changes to marching band, with the parade band, and the, um, the music, we're able to do that because when you look at the BOCES costs later on in this budget, you're gonna see an increase there, what we're expecting BOCES uh, arts and ed funding to be. We take a look at, uh, there's some clerical support, as I described, You'll see some additions at McNamara, Palmer, and um, that is based on those buildings getting an additional. So each building at the elementary level will have a teacher aide, a typist one, and a school secretary built into the budget. It's not consistent right now across the district. So we're, we're making that um, same personnel in every building. questions on the salaries? Joe, I just have a question about um, the instructional salaries for pre-K. Yes. In the pre-K, that's something that was funded differently. So, so we've built in some funding just as a, as a backup because we're anticipating if at some point, you know, slowly over time, we're trying to embed that in our general fund budget. Um, because if, if it goes away, I don't personally believe that it's going to go away given the federal uh, push as well as the state push. But if for some reason it does, we've slowly over time started to embed those people back into our buildings um, in our general fund budget. So that's why you see an increase there. Um, it's essentially some additional fund balance because we are anticipating, based on the governor's runs, the UPK funding to continue next school year. And then my other question is, when you talk about the arts and ed, mm -hmm. um, so this was a long time ago, but um, involved in PTA, I know they use the arts and ed um, for a lot of their funding for school events for the kids. So does that affect their funding that they can use? So we made a, sh a shift quite a few years ago um, that they're still able, if they're, if they're looking to do something and they're making a donation to the district, but we've really increased the arts and ed account over the last four budget cycles so that it's on the districts. We've, 
So I, I think we're up to 100. I can, I can flip to that page 100 and just get there. $141,000. Know, you see a $40,000 increase. Um, but that used to be in the 20s when I was pretty much first in this position. Um, and we slowly added. So they work with the building principals. This is really the building principals set the, um, they work with their PTAs, but they're the ones that are submitting the applications um, because the district ultimately gets the reimbursement. We've really pushed, thankfully, through our joint PTAs to have them working on other things to support our students as opposed to you know, some of these events because we have built into the budget those um, activities, special events, engagements that the building principals are, are working on. So, so if they want to continue using that, this, the, what you're proposing has nothing to do, like they can still do that if they want? Yeah, most of the work though, they've shifted their priorities, so they're not necessarily, they're not, most of the arts and ed events is going through the building administrator and what we've already budgeted. So we're asking PTAs to utilize their funding in other ways to support students in school. So they're doing, for example, um, most recently the Eldon PTA purchased the walkie talkies, where before they would have had to support student programming really that's our responsibility so we made a shift over the last few years to increase increase arts and ed and just make that a part of our everyday experience so it's going through the building administrator that doesn't mean that uh, the PTAs might not have a special you know hey we saw this and we want you to consider this certainly the building principals do that um, but it really is district um, working through and Kim I don't know if there's anything you want to add based on Know, you're in Tiffany's work with the arts net. No, I think that's, I mean, it's just a way to expand our dollars and have them go farther. So, you know, we could have continued to build over the years, as Dr. DeBarber was saying, and then this year we kind of took it a step farther to really work with um, the arts at the high school, the music program at the high school, to say, okay, you know what, we'd like to increase these things and this is an easy way to stretch the dollars. So that line is going to continue to grow. Um, we kind of took a, a, a guess for next year, and then as they're using the service more, we'll continue to increase those lines for the aid that we get back. So really it doesn't have any impact on the net local share because we'll be generating the aid on the revenue side, if that makes sense. And they're actually very excited about it, and they've, they've been great to work with to, to make that happen and change the process. I think it's great that the district's kind of stepping in and, and um, you know, uh, providing some of this programming. Um, somebody that's been more involved in PTA than, than me can probably kind of speak more to this, but I, I think if I recall correctly, there, for every fundraising event, there needs to be a certain number of programs that are offered, so the, the PTAs have to document we we did this fundraiser and this fundraiser supported these particular programs but i don't know if that that affects that or if that's kind of where that yeah the the arts and ed kind of piece was coming into so some of the just to give another example maybe that might help clarify too so some of the buildings have the um, the book vending machines so they'll tie that into a special guest um, lecture or speaker it's going through arts and ads at the building administration and you know the one book one read uh, for the school all of that would be a connection so there is there is there obviously is um, fundraising work that the PTAs are utilizing but you know it's it's a joint effort between the building administrator and the PTA so I, I think we're covered it, at least that hasn't come up in our joint PTA meetings over the last two years given the shift I mean they've actually appreciated you know, being able to, to, to not get tied up in fundraising for those things when we have the ability. So they're, they're taking on new challenges, which are, are good for our students. There are no other questions about the salaries and those changes. Um, shifting to equipment. First, contractual. Equipment, sorry. Um, what you'll see here, most of this 
change. There's uh, equipment at Baker, there's equipment at Durgy. A lot of those increases are based on some additional calculators that would be utilized in some uh, art equipment, uh, kilns, other science equipment. Um, so that's why you see the increase there. The largest increase is in core curriculum equipment and the, to the tune of $1.25 million. We are looking to purchase instruments um, to start a to start a priority here that we have here to make sure that all students have access. We're starting first at the elementary level in grades uh, three, four, and five to purchase um, the instruments for the beginning band and the wind ensemble programs. And eventually the hope is that that will continue to work its way up through the secondary buildings. Um, you know, one of the barriers that we have right now for students is that not every student, unless you rent an instrument and we have only a few to loan, um, they're not being able to participate in, in those programs. So we believe if we're um, working to um, make those instruments available to all students, we're going to see some of our participation increase at the elementary level, which will work its way through the middle, the junior high, and the high school. And as you know, our band, uh, marching band program, our wind ensemble, our strings, you name it, um, our choral program, it is of high quality and, and we want to continue to expand that. So we've chosen to put that money there um, and then it's a it's a one-time expense which allows us because of the aid to then reallocate or purpose that funding in the 24-25 budget to another area. Joe, in reference to, to that um, that program, you said it was grades three through five. Three through five right now, yes. And it's both band and orchestra. Correct. Um, are you able to provide us with like how many kids currently um, participate in those areas yeah. um, and so the district would be purchasing all of those instruments? Correct. I mean certainly just like we do with calculators, textbooks, etc. Um, Chromebooks. Uh, so we would have those for students. It's going to take some time over the course of next school year so we we wouldn't, we'd have to prioritize students that maybe didn't have the ability next year just because to get $1.2 million worth of equipment at, at one time before school starts, that's going to be a, a little bit of a challenge. But we, uh, the administrators and directors, uh, the business office have been working with vendors um, to basically, we have some accurate quotes, we're ready to go pending successful approval of the uh, budget. Okay, and then what happens with um like, do they, do they get turned in at the end of the school year? Um, and then, um, obviously, you guys have been looking into, like, repair or maintenance yep. or So cleaning. we, that future budgets would have... Um, Is that the, be done here, or are they absolutely in the household? There's the ability for some of these to be um, refurbished during the summer with our staff. They'll be trained to do that. And then any other major repairs, similar to other, you know, Chromebooks, things like that, we'd have to send out. Just to clarify, the 1.3 is to give every student in 3 through 5 an instrument? If they are participating in the strings or instrumental band program, okay. yes. So if they don't do that, what, where does that money go? It stays there for future purchases? Yeah, so we, based on the numbers that we have right now right. with students in those programs, with some additional numbers that we're anticipating having it grow because of access. We have, with that dollar amount budgeted, what we believe would be necessary moving forward for the number of instruments to make sure that every student who wants to participate in the strings program or the instrumental uh, band program access to an instrument. But Some students choose choral instead of band or strings. And just, just to be clear, just to reiterate, we would love to have those all here physically in September, but based on the lead times and the companies will not actually tell us which, which instruments we can get until we can place the order, which to Dr. DeBarber's point, we can't do that until after a successful budget vote. So I just want to be clear for people listening at home and here, 
this is the, the, the plan, but as of September, we cannot guarantee that we're gonna have all those instruments present just based on the, the process that we have to go through to get there. I assume you wouldn't purchase them anyway until you knew how many you needed, right? I mean, if you had, you wouldn't buy 30 trumpets if you only had 15 kids that wanted to play it, right? And we have that information because we've been working with the uh, strings and the instrumental uh, band instructors at those levels. They have, they have that information. They know year after year, historically, how many students want to play the trumpet, how many want to play the cello or the uh, violin. I've got a violin and a cello at home, so I know that. Um, so, I mean, they have that information. And they also are surveying students that are currently in second grade to who are, who are expressing interest next year as they move into third grade. So we have a good sense of what instruments would be needed. So, thank you, sir. Um, so, with the increase, or uh, putting it out there for every student to be uh, have availability, obviously that would, what do we do about the instructional side with the band, the orchestra teachers, um, space, um, how does that calculate? So the building administrators, yeah, the, the building administrators would be working through that. Um, certainly, long term, as part of our next phase of our capital improvements and the RFP that we just um, approved recently for the work with our community stakeholder group on the next phase of elementary work for our um, capital projects. I do believe we have to think about those items long term what that would look like as far as enhancements to those elementary school buildings. So that'll be a part of it. And that as far as staffing though, we do have staff that currently um, work within those buildings and we do have additional fund balance based on needs if we have an increase in staff, if we have an increase in need for staff to provide those lessons, then we have the ability within the budget to um, hire additional music instructors to make that happen. Right, and, and that leads to a question when we talked to agenda planning about not necessarily, you know, hiring another administrator to oversee fine arts because currently there isn't anyone. Is there conversation or a timeline where some of this money could be invested in leveraging someone within the, the fine arts community and the district to help oversee um, our, our rather large and expansive and, ex and successful programs? You know, rather than you know having other individuals carry it as another task or a job, but really having someone who understands the medium to, to really continue to help this program to, to flourish. And we've had we that have, conversation. We have, oh. right, I'm sorry, Joe. We had that conversation today to talk about different models of you know how could that look? Could it be a department chair? Could it be uh, you know somebody in the current. Uh, uh, music capacity uh, doing that as part of their day um you know you know carving out a couple periods a day so i mean that's we're still open to discussion and we'd like to involve our teaching staff in that that discussion as well just to get their input we have we have also i mean there's it's not a secret we have people that are close to the end um, of their career administratively and you know every time that there's a, a change or adjustment looking at things differently with some of that breakage um, I do know that there are some music educators in our district um, that are pursuing CASs um, and that ultimately plays into this as well long term so part of my so I want to go back to um, when you were talking to district staff about the numbers weren't able to participate in their fourth or fifth band orchestra were there many families or children that couldn't because they couldn't provide your purchase if you have is it an overwhelming amount of, of kids that were so i would um you know certainly look to tony and renee for additional because they're the ones that were having conversations but um, one of the things that we've tried to do is come up in the dei committee uh, you know just conversation in general um, no, people, not, not everyone's going to be willing to just share, oh, I can't afford this, or 
And so we do have some instruments that are loaned out, um, but we want to make this available to everyone who wants um, an instrument. And we saw this as a way to support those programs and enhance the programs, and also build in a one-time purchase so that we could utilize that funding going forward in a future budget in other areas. So it was, we were kind of looking at it from, from that point of view. But I mean, I would, I would say that the teachers are the ones that are gonna, we, we don't know how many kids are truly you know, not given that option because you know, some people may not. It's, it's the same thing with like free and reduced lunch. We have families that for whatever reason, they won't put in an application even though they are eligible for that. There's a stigma related to that. So our, our thinking behind all this is to, to do away with that and to help build our instrumental music and fine arts program. I think that's a good point. Uh, you know, we probably saw a pretty significant increase in the participation in, in meals when it was universally available. Um, the same thing might be the case here. I would suspect also that you have, you know, fourth and fifth grade students who've already made their purchase, and, and that gives kind of a year or so buffer in terms of being able to provide those uh, instruments. You know, uh, to those students who haven't, you'll still have some that. Well, I would prefer to, to have my own, buy my own, and not use one of the So, I mean, there's going to be a little bit of that, but being able to, to kind of universally put it out there will likely reduce that stigma. In, in the, fine, the fine arts folks have been working with other districts, so we have a couple similar size, similar wealth uh, ratio schools that are making these available for families across the state. We've been in communication with them as well as some of the more um, urban settings. So again, we're getting feedback from multiple sources. Um, I feel like a Zion because everyone said everything I wanted to say, but just to kind of recap some of the things, uh, like Joe had said, in the community group, there were several parents that brought up the fact uh, of equity in regards to instrumentation and that kind of thing. So um, I was gonna mention that, but also to to what Tanya was saying in regards to um, assisting the fine arts department, you, like even if it was like an administrative assistant or something like that, to, to kind of help out with some of their their duties that they get they get tasked with. Um, and in regards to the the amount, is any of that um, something you had brought up? Is, is can some of that money be used for facilities, or is it only for instruments themselves? This right here is dedicated to um, instruments. Uh, but you know, moving forward, you know, we could certainly choose to. Most districts don't, other than the um, capital outlay project, they don't utilize their general fund budget to fund um, facility improvements. It's really the capital outlay projects and then capital projects. So I think this will be continue to be a larger conversation with the facilities committee and you know future capital outlays across the district. Okay. Good, what we brought because I mean this is a great start because you have to have the equipment to you know what I mean to get more people involved but like you were saying in regards to the facilities at the elementary school buildings and stuff like that but that wouldn't come out of this that come out of facilities budget and that kind of thing of a capital project or capital project okay and then um, Durgy is obviously there's some changes there Kim did you want to add anything yeah. So we did look, I mean, obviously in the Durgy renovation and design, we made some pretty significant changes in that building mm -hmm. um, with having a capital project to go forward that obviously the arts have been involved with um, and the music teachers, and I think they have been pretty happy with the changes that we're going to be able to make in that building. So I think as we continue to look at, you know, those spaces and we have a long-term plan of how to support our students overall, which is why it's so important with the capital reserves and generating um, that ability to continue moving forward. Um, it really makes the most sense because when you start talking about capital project funding and the aid ability, it makes sense to be able to generate that aid back as much as possible when we get into infrastructure issues. Right. Yeah, and, and looking at the outlines and stuff for the stuff that's going to be happening at Derby is great. Everyone's going to have their own space. And I know at the high school, though, they have a lot of shared space. So that might be, and I, I know like you had said, future capital projects, but just wanted to kind of throw that out in this space as well. It is on the radar, and I'm sure it will come up in the facilities committee meeting. I actually had a <laughs> meeting with 
one of the uh, fine arts uh, instructors this morning, um, and, it, and it came up at the high school level too. So, you know, I, I said to the individual, that great point. Certainly, there's going to be more conversation as we move forward. Um, obviously, the work at Derby is a start, and hopefully, it will bleed into the other buildings as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's great. And we'll say, as a as a parent who's rented and purchased instruments, it can be a pretty steep cost if, and a barrier to some. So, uh, I think it's a great start. Um, probably important to point out too. This is a maximum, right? I mean, if we don't get the participation growth that we're calculating right now, then you know we don't necessarily spend the one point three million. This is just this caps it off at that. End. No, you're a hundred percent correct. And some of it could be utilized to purchase some additional equipment at the secondary buildings, larger equipment that we may need um, in those areas as well. So it's all encompassing, but the focus is really initially at that uh, three, four, five level. Is this like a one-time grant thing, or how did we qualify for this, or is this just something that's built into the budget? So based on our uh, state aid runs from the governor's budget, which we anticipate the same, if not hopefully less restrictions with the uh, legislative budget that gets approved, um, based on what our um, funding is being fully funded across the, the uh, state aid point of view, that we just have that large of an increase that we can utilize it in this way. Question. So right now it's tentatively third through fifth grade. What's the long-term plan for additional grades? So we would be building that in. We've had discussions about what that looks like in the 24-25 budget. Um, it wouldn't be, I mean, as extensive right off the bat. It might take a little bit more time. But the thought would be that as those students continue to work through the program and if they maintain. Um, you know, we would be able to purchase those instruments as they, as they move forward. A lot of times when students get to the high school level, and again, it's that unknown based on the students and whether they, they purchase, you know, because they're so invested, they want their own instrument. And again, we don't want to exclude students, so it's going to take some time to figure out how many kids truly need an instrument at that um, secondary level. It's no different than when we first started with calculators, graphing calculators. Initially, it was you know families purchase and we had some on hand. Now we essentially have enough that they're available to every student. Um, if they, you know, and a lot of them are, you know, they're just given one as opposed to having families uh, purchase them. Certainly they can if they want, but we don't require that. We have them available for every student. Right, if there's no more questions on equipment, I'll shift to materials and supplies. Uh, excuse me, can't read that. Contractual. Um, the big change in contractual that you'll see here um, is the, if I scroll down to contractual SROs, which I, I spoke about, you'll see the shift from just under 300,000 to 625. That's the additional five SRPOs right here. See it? Again, we're embedding that in our in our budget to sustain that. That is contractual. I move on to materials and supplies. You'll see increases in all of the materials and supplies for every building, more significantly some at the secondary level, um, but you'll see an increase at the elementary levels as well based on the cost of sub materials. One area that I'll point out, the core curriculum instructional supplies is going from um, 24,000 to 40,000. A lot of that's for the science investigations and new assessments, some additional resources there, um, as well as other materials and supplies needed at the elementary level. Last but not least, OCs programming, the OCs budget, the, again, everything is based on our uh, initial service requests. Students are not um, 
denied access to any of the BOCES programs, whether it be CTE, New Visions, um, uh, any of the other alternate ed programs. What you'll see here, um, the beauty of the BOCES budget from last year on is that uh, we're billed with a rolling, basically average, based on the number of students that we have. So it's not you're not going to see as many fluctuations like you've seen in prior years based on the number of students that are enrolled. Um, so that helps with stability uh, here. Um, but I wanted to point out, based on our conversation earlier, that 108,000 in the Performing Arts Oswego, that's the Arts and Ed, going to 140. So overall, I would say this budget is truly, at least instructional budget, student friendly and it's focused on expanding opportunities uh, for our students. Uh, we've had a lot of course offerings added over the last year, year and a half. Um, there'll continue to be course offerings added um, based on student interest. We're excited about what the strategic plan will bring and how that helps to drive some of the decisions moving forward in the instructional budget. So I'd open it up for any other further questions you have. Uh, I don't have a question. I just know that um, you know you've been preparing us for this increase for the past two years as we continue to get federal funding, um, being intentional about where that funding was going to be able to sustain that through as as that funding started to dry up. So I appreciate you know really that that forced loss and, and that um, that preparation. You know, an 11 so ish percent increase sounds pretty significant, but you know, over the past two or three years, you've done a good job of preparing us um, to hit this point. I think what you're going to find too, it's been a team effort, but certainly when you look at the what we're projecting moving forward with uh, you know, the tax increase, tax cap, and uh, you know, just the funding from the state, you're going to see it's not. Not as bad as you know it seems when you see the budget to budget increase. I mean, we're not going to see a significant budget to budget increases. At least, my belief, you know, 24, 25, we're not going to see it like this. We're we're fortunate enough that we're getting the aid that we're getting, which is allowing us to do this work. But we're also trying to prepare for the long term. Yes. To your point, so you know the audit committee will be again looking at the fund balance management plan the long-range plan because this isn't sustainable right I mean we needed to plan and that's where I think we went to the one-time purchases so then that money can be redistributed throughout the rest of the budget in future years um, so that we're not making difficult decisions at that point that's what we're really trying to prevent I appreciate you for saying that because we're not an ATM Right. So at one point we have to think about the taxpayers, and we don't want to put them in a predicament where they're in a, where you're going to have to make tough decisions and make tough decisions as well. So thank you, Kim. And thank you, Dr. So when we present the budget um, for final or approval, um, we will be within the levy limit and uh, are able to do some amazing things for students. So um, I thought it was fantastic um, how the, the planning has come together. Kim wants me to go to the uh, budget change. So these are really, and this is another area that I'd like to look at this a little bit differently too, in all honesty, um, because these are changes that we see internally, but I'm not sure um, if it really has a thread that makes sense as we jump around in presenting the budget throughout the budget process. But a couple of things I'll point out is that these changes really, again, are based on the BOCES final service requests that we don't get until this time of year. So really um, the, the one decrease in the finance and food service that's based on the services that we're asking to participate in. We have moved a lot of things to electronic format which decreases paper, which decreases cost, decreases printing, all of those type of things. So that's some of those changes and then depending on what services we're, we are asking to participate in. The other large changes down in the 2250 lines those are all the special ed lines and those are all directly based on what services we believe students will need. So you see like the SCAPE program went up, which tells me we probably have an additional student in that program that we're gonna need to pay for for next year or we anticipate. And again, these are all based on students sitting in those seats 
So that can change based on people coming in and out of our district from year to year. The decrease in the Oswego Ed program, again, those shifts can be from one student who is no longer in that program for whatever reason they may have started in that program and we wanted continuity or they had the best program because of something else they were doing. So those are the shifts that you see in those 2250 lines. It's not that we're taking somebody out of a program, it's literally based on the needs of our students when they're evaluated. Um, and those are really the two major changes on this form. Are there any questions about the, the changes? So these are all incorporated into our final budget number that I think we will see again in a couple minutes when we get through the tax cap and the state aid. So the tax cap is in a different format from last year, I apologize, um, but that was one of the ones that we decided to kind of transition because there was a lot of uh, parentheses and whatnot in the old version of the formula. So this is literally what we put into the state. So we take a look at our tax levy from last year, we apply the things that we need to apply, tax-based growth factor and allowable growth factor, obviously those are both totally out of our control. You can take a look down the pilots um, in the, the two years from last year to this year, the pilots um, did change slightly and that was the main reason for our tax levy changing. So those, I mentioned the last meeting, they are actually due like the same day we have to submit our tax cap. It's so convenient for us. Um, but it's all good, we have good people helping us and, and we were able to hit all of those deadlines. So when you take a look at the bottom line, our tax cap is a little bit lower. When we were first calculating this, we thought it was gonna be higher based on the pilots of where we were. And then another pilot came through so that, that did um, bring the tax levy to a 2.85. Historically, in most districts, we go out to the cap that exponentially can impact the district year over year. So 2.85. And the main reason that we're at 2.85 in all honesty is because of the tax base growth factor. When I when I play, I have this in a spreadsheet so I can do like the what if scenarios and we can you know talk more about that next year too if we're changing the process a little bit. But when you put the tax base growth factor back to what it was last year, that percentage comes down significantly. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it was much more in line with where we were last year. And then if you keep in mind the inflation from last year and this year, is exponentially higher than the 2% that we're capped at to even consider this. So, you know, even being mindful of, of consumers and with inflation, um, I think there's a number of reasons why this is in the best interest of the district, um, honestly, to make sure that we're maintaining that uh, tax levy at, at the, the highest we can go out with. So that basically generates about 1.8 million additional revenue in our budget which we'll call that a sustainable revenue, right? Because we get that tax levy in every year, like we get state aid in every year um, versus a district that is sustaining their budget based on their district savings, um, which we allocate, you know, just under 3 million of that, but we're able to allocate the same million, 3 million year over year, which I'll explain when we get to the last conversation. So if we move on to the state aid analysis, this is really what's allowing us to make some of those huge changes that you're seeing in opportunities for students such as the musical instruments. We were not anticipating um, this increase this year. We were increasing, we had about three million increase last year in foundation aid and foundation aid is the portion of state aid that does not have strings attached to it. What I mean by that is it's not an expense driven aid. So when you look at BOCES aid, high cost private, all of those other um, aids, there's something that's tied to it, be student enrollment or we have to spend it to get it back. Foundation aid is not typically like that. However, they did tie some strings to our, a portion of our foundation aid, which we'll talk about. Um, so we were really looking, thinking we were gonna get about another three million when we really ended up getting more than double that this year. But again, I think that has to do with our stable enrollment um, and the combined wealth ratios that we're looking at throughout the whole state. We're really, when we dug down into it, um, and Dr. Davis, I don't know if she still believes we're really gonna get this much money, but I think we've made, we've made progress. She has never seen anything like this in her career, nor have Tiffany or I. <laughs> it's true, it is happening. Uh, we even called Quest our attorney to verify, to verify our data. The only thing I wanna caution everybody is we still have 877,000 and it's still um, in the foundation, baked into the foundation aid that's high impact uh, tutoring. And we are um, 
advocating for flexibility because uh, it's limited uh, to the grade levels that can be tutored at three through eight. So it doesn't even allow us to make decisions to tutor students that we think might need it the most uh, at a various, you know, the other grade levels, especially at the early immersion reading uh, level where students are building that foundation. So at this point, we are doing some advocacy with our legislators and our different groups such as NISCIS and school board to talk about, um, we we're hoping when the, the next run comes out that that, that uh, limit is removed from how we spend the 877000 So uh, and they, we'll, keep the board, we'll keep the board informed. We do have to have a plan B if that happens. And we, we, we do have a semi-plan B if we have to, but in addition to that, the good news is that's only for one year. That's only for next year. The year after that, it will not be a, a set aside as we call it. It won't have special strings attached to it. So that's really what's allowing us to move forward. So we always take a look and then we analyze. If you take a look across for specifically transportation aid, we back off from that, what the governor fund says, because it is an expense driven aid. So if we don't spend all of that, we're not gonna generate all the aid. Um, and to Tiffany's credit, I think this is the first year when we started looking at our fund balances, we actually had underestimated our revenues last year. So our revenues are actually coming in higher than our projection. Um, which she has been working on since she's been in district. So we are very conservative when it comes to our numbers um, to make sure that we're on the proper side of that when we're closing out the year um, for, for many reasons. Um, so, you know, our, our building aid, our fiscal advisors do a great job with helping us maintain a consistent local share, which that also impacts the tax levy uh, when we were talking about that. So that's kind of the scenario of how, how we're funding and how we got to where we want to be. And then if we go to the next one, it'll kind of summarize it and put it all together. Um, for the board so this goes down through all of our revenues at the top you can see the pilots at the top I'm not going to read down through everything for you but you can see the state aid numbers are coming in here the building aid um, the one thing I will point out is when you get down to the appropriated fund balance we were able to reduce that slightly from last from this current school year into next year just based on the revenues that we have coming in the state aid and the tax the, the tax cap um, anticipated so we will be talking again with the audit committee in June in regards to those reserves and how we utilize those we'll also be bringing forward a resolution for an up to amount of reserve utilization for the current school year so we have approval in the current school year for when the auditors close out our books at the end of the year so bottom line when you're looking at the growth in the budget it is an 8.59 percent budget increase we really, whenever we're looking at the budget, and I know this seems really simplistic, but I just have to say it, we have to have a balanced budget, right? So when we're having additional revenues coming in, we have to have the expenses to show that we're spending that revenue on them um, in order to have that balanced budget. And we you know, looked at backing off the state aid as much as we felt was realistic. We can't unnecessarily back off from state aid if we don't have a justification for that. So that's kind of how the whole picture came to fruition, um, that it is you know, a large budget to budget increase, but I don't think this is gonna happen. If you look at next year, we'll be lucky if we get 3% increase on state aid. So we'll be right back to where we, we typically have been before more than likely. Any questions? That was a whole lot of information and I apologize. I think we also put in the weekly letter, this is, Dr. Davis said that this is in the range of where other school districts are at similar size within the region. So you're gonna see a lot of schools coming out with very similar, I believe, uh, you know, tax levy percentage increases. Tax levy, absolutely, because of that growth factor that's right within range. Other districts may not see, be seeing the budget to budget increase because their foundation aid increases were over the past few years gradually building in, and we were one of the last districts to get that final piece of our foundation aid that's been owed to us for many years technically. Any other questions? No, just as, uh, you know, when you get to June and we start looking at reserves again and the reserve plan, looks like you're using approximately 800, a little over 800,000 in the ERS. You also want to consider 
when you have to reload that uh, so that you can continue with uh, offsetting future costs for ERS expenses. And yes, we will bring both of those resolutions forward at the same time is what we did last year, what we're going to utilize for sure and what we're going to refund up to. So hopefully we have that covered. Thank you. So if there are no further questions. Just, just oh, one quick question. Um, I know we always solicit our community members to sit on the budget committees. I was just wondering what the level of participation was this year. And We've had great participation. Uh, I, honestly, I think the um, fact that we've done a lot through Google Meet or Zoom has really helped uh, drive more participants just because it's easier for family or folks that are busy, whether they're at work or they're home, they can, they can uh, log in uh, from those locations instead of being here physically. Certainly, I think there's more conversation, as Kim alluded to earlier, about you know what does the budget cycle look like next year moving forward, and maybe there's other ways that we can solicit even more input and, and uh, feedback and interest based on whatever we come up with is the, the process moving forward. It's very similar to what happens here. The first conversation, we have a lot of people present and there's a lot of discussion. And then by the second one, we might have one or two people and it might be a five minute meeting. So that's kind of what we've been talking about. You know, is there a benefit to that, that, that second discussion? Um, if we can incorporate some way of following up with, with changes or different things that might come about. So we'll move to the leadership report. Um, I'm gonna just pinch in here uh, for Dr. Davis with the Smart Schools Bond Act timeline and discussion. So we did put this in the, the weekly letter. Uh, there is a document here on uh, board docs for the public. So we are holding a meeting on March 16th. We're required uh, a planning committee meeting. It's comprised of a variety of stakeholders. Uh, this is gonna occur before the March 20th meeting. At the March 20th board meeting, we will present uh, a proposal to the board uh, for use and uh, adoption of a resolution uh, for the preliminary plan. We'll have this information in the weekly letter as well prior to. Uh, following that um, board of ed meeting and the presentation of that plan on 320, uh, we will uh, submit, um, you know, we have to outline how the funds are being submitted. We'll file um, some additional information uh, with uh, New York State facilities and then after 30 days which just so happens to be uh, at the April 24th Board of Ed meeting we'll hold a five-minute public hearing and then anyone who wishes to comment on the proposal which would have been out at that point for over that 30-day that period uh, we'll be looking for the board then to lead that public hearing resuming in the regular meeting uh, a, another adoption of a second resolution which will be approving that plan um, and I would point out that all of the discussion that the Planning Committee will be having regarding the plan and how we end up spending uh, our, some of our remaining funding is based on dialogue that we received from our community through the thought exchange that went out at the uh, beginning of February so we got a lot of feedback from that thought exchange uh, regarding the options that are available to us. Any questions on that? So does um, does this committee already exist? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and all the stakeholders. All the stakeholders are covered. Yes. All right. And then Kim, did you want to talk a little bit about the legal notice and the annual vote? Sure. So I think we usually discuss this at the prior meeting. So if everybody is okay and ready to move forward with the budget number we discussed tonight for the second reading of the instructional budget, after that at our next meeting, we would like to bring forward the legal notice that will go out in the paper. That will allow us to put the budget number in that legal notice from the very first time we publicize it. So uh, just as a recap, that's about a six page document that will be asking the board to approve. It will have all the propositions in it. The budget proposition, our student transport vehicles, all of these have been approved by the board already. Uh, the capital project resolution, the capital reserve fund resolution, the land acquisition, and then it also has um, the board of education members and the terms and the names of the people that are up this year for re-election. 
So there's a lot in that. Um, I think we can you know, put it in the Friday letter as well, just so you have another chance to take a look at it. Um, but this is kind of, I know we, on jumping ahead, under new business, we're bringing back the budget calendar just because the initial schedule we had is a little bit later than um, what we would prefer to have. So again, that would, that's one of those discussions for next year as well. We brought that back for readoption to match up with what we're asking to be done with the um, budget being adopted at the next And if you think about what we did last year, we actually did the same thing last year. We approved the budget at the second meeting in March. Any questions? I guess the final piece we have here is the policies. The policy committee met um, back on February 13th. We have two policies that are um, on the agenda red line for first reading. The first one is school safety plans, and the second one is staff use of computerized information resources. So if you have questions, we'll take them now. Otherwise, they will appear on the March 20th meeting for second reading and approval. Thank you. All right, moving on to new business. Item A, resolve that the Board of Education approve the trip request for the girls softball team to travel and participate in the softball spring trip to Ripken Experience, Pitten Ford, Tennessee, April 2nd through 7th, 2023, pursuant to the attached. Can I have a motion, please? Move. Jeff first. Second, Matt. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 8-0. Item B. Resolved that the Board of Education approve the Varsity Boys Lacrosse team to travel and participate in a non-league game versus Niskayuna, March 31st to April 1st, 2023 at Niskayuna High School in Niskayuna, New York, pursuant to the attached. Can I have a motion, please? Move. Denise first. Second. Second, Matt. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes 8-0. Item C, resolved that the Board of Education approve the girls across team to travel to Niagara Falls, New York and participate in a non-league game versus Pittsburgh Sutherland, April 4th to 6th, 2023 at Pittsburgh Sutherland High School in Pittsburgh, New York, pursuant to the attached. Can I have a motion, please? Move. Jeff first. Second. Second, Denise. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes 8-0. Item D, resolve the Board of Education approve the Baldwinsville Marching Band to travel and participate in the Bands of America Regional Competition in Toledo, Ohio, October 6th through 8th, 2023, pursuant to the attached on motion, please. Second. Jeff first. Second. Shelley second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 8-0. Item E, resolve that the Board of Education approve a secret resolution for the 2023 Capital Outlay Improvement Project pursuant to the attached. Can I have a motion, please? Move. Jeff first. Second, Matt. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 8-0. Item F, resolve the Board of Education approve the Bonsville Central School District budget calendar process for 2023 to 2024 revised pursuant to the attached. Can I have a motion, please? Move. Jeff first. Second, Sam. Any questions or discussion? I have a quick question. Um, in reference to May, May 8th, um, the, that meeting, can I'll just help me out with the Meet the Candidates tonight. Are we doing that? I also heard some talk about the district PTA. Where, where, do we, where do we stand on that? So we're doing, we are doing everything that we did last year on March 8th as publicized, May 8th, sorry. Not March, that would be bad. <laughs> That's like two days from now. May 8th. Um, and so there would be time for the meet the candidate like we typically do. My understanding is through the joint PTA that they are looking at doing something outside um, that would be on another date um, that people would be available if they're open. I think I don't want to speak to where they're looking at as far as locations. 
but I also know that the um, Pack B is also doing what they did last year as well. At least that's what they've been told us that they're planning on interviewing all of the candidates uh, with a series of questions, and then they'll be broadcasting that. So between what we do for the public hearing and the meet the candidate, the Pack B, what they're planning, and then I believe it's the McNamara PTA. If I remember correctly, they were trying to jointly work together to do something. But we have a joint PTA meeting coming up here, I think, uh, that will have more information, I'm sure, following that meeting. Okay, so the meeting on the 8th is a board meeting along with yep. the... Okay, well, that, we didn't do that last year. No, that was the change that we talked about at the earlier okay. in the year that um, we were maintaining based on conversations with prior We were scheduled for a facility meeting that night, correct? And then we also just had another one that was canceled for another scheduling yeah, issue. Yeah, the okay, that's the same day. Okay. Facilities is being canceled, yeah. Okay, so we only have one meeting being canceled. Not to correct. Okay. It's just the facilities meeting, and based on their work and where they're at, we moved, um, we moved one up. Yeah, there's a meeting coming up before the end of the month. That was rescheduled. Yes. Okay. There's one on the twentieth. Twentieth. Yeah. I knew it was something like that. Any other questions on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Passes 8-0, item G, resolve the Board of Education approve the disposal of surplus equipment and instructional materials pursuant to the attach. Can I have a motion, please? Move. Jeff first. Second. Second Wien. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 8-0. We're now to the round table portion of the meeting. Yeah, sure. I've got stuff on um, so I'm going to share it and put it in the space, and um, I'm always appreciative of Grace and and the board's ability to listen for some level of understanding. I appreciate that. So, um, just thinking about policies, procedures, and practices. So I'm bringing that in the space because there were decisions that were made at the last board meeting. Uh, and I think about it as in terms of policy, we as a board are expected, right, to make certain decisions, right? And then I think about the procedures in which those are done. A decision was made, we followed policy. Procedurally, I have questions, and then there's of course the practice. And so I, I'm thinking about practice, and, and I open the space to the, to the board and thinking about how to move forward. Every decision that we make moving forward from the decisions that were made at the last meeting and moving forward will be setting a precedent. And I just want you to all be mindful of the feedback from the community, what we need to really establish and build a bridge. So not only is the district successful moving forward, but our future superintendent is successful. There are decisions we are going to make that are going to have consequences and everything we do will set a precedent. So I'm asking the board, I'm imploring the board to be mindful and thoughtful and to not, to think about policy, to think about procedures that we are trying to build with our current acting superintendent and that is my hope with the future superintendent. And it's important that we honor that and respect that because I think when we talk about policy and procedure, that's one thing and then there's those practices, also those unspoken rules that there's a lot of inconsistency. There's a lot. So how do we as a board, how do we build that bridge with the district office that traditionally we may not have those easy, you know, modes or pathways to communication. So I just, it's just been on my mind and I also think about moving forward as a board, you know, thinking about policies, procedures and practices I'm also thinking about what we can do to become stronger. Um, we also have to think about who's in our fears of influence, right, to ensure that we as a board are successful. 
um, and, and those people in our sphere of influence who are support, supposed to support us, um, to advise us, to be able to make well-informed decisions so we're able to have um, some impact on supporting the mission and vision. So the reason why I say this is I think as we move forward, I, I'm really gonna implore the district to really explore the people that support us in making well-informed decisions. I do think there are some within that sphere that needs to be re-examined. I do think that there are some who have crossed the boundaries of bias and prejudice and some ethical issues in my own opinion. So just things that we're gonna need to talk about as a board, but for consideration for future, um, for future consideration, um, I really would like the board to consider um, opening um, an RFP for a new um, legal representation. Um, and that's all I can say at this time. However, in light of what has happened over the last year, I, I think in terms of the best interest of the board and the best interest of protecting the district, I think it's important that the board has separate representation um, in light of what's happened over the last year. Um, and it's really important to put certain individuals um, and other things in our sphere of influence that's going to help us support our, do, our, support our work in the best interest of the district. And I feel that um, if we're going to be able to be successful to support Dr. DeBarbery as we move forward, when he does assume that role, it's important that we start with, with that. So that's all i got to say. Thank you. So are you asking for us to do? I'm asking us for considering to open an RFP so we can have different legal representation in the, in the next fiscal year. That's what I'm asking. So that is something that was discussed a few months ago. We did say that we we're gonna bring that forward in March. And I'm not sure I know that not sure what standard because I haven't been here long, how frequent that is done for professional services. We do that at the reorg meeting, which is July 1, which would be um, the appropriate time to do all your professional services. That's, that's to approve them. So if we were to consider an RFP, that would have to be done prior to that. Correct. Right. So that's something we can take into account at agenda planning for the next meeting, whether that's something we want to put on the agenda. Correct. So Jeff, are you saying the process is bringing up an agenda planning or? Well, if we want something on the agenda for the meeting, that would be the place to discuss it and put it on the agenda. What, what's the process like so we, we open up an RFP so in the past when and we've done this for um, our what do you call it um, the building people the architects, architects and uh, general contractors we basically put out an RFP and see who responds and then it's uh, evaluated generally by Kim's office and um, they put a spreadsheet together we see who has the best rates the best off you know it's basically you just everybody bids on what they can provide, and then we select as a board which one to go with. We just did it for the auditors. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very, and usually in the past, I think it's been either a fifteen or thirty day turnaround. Kim, I don't know what's general, but thirty. Yeah, thirty day turnaround to get all bids, and then so if we do some, if if as a board we decide to do that, um, and we did it March twentieth and April twentieth, they'd be due and whatever the next meeting after that is, we would go forward with whatever our decision is. That would probably be the timeline, but we wouldn't approve that till July, whatever, at the New York meeting, so we got plenty of time. Right, so a lot of times we, um, like for the auditors that you mentioned, the BOCES um, had an RFP, which sometimes, if they have multiple districts, they get different pricing. So for like our internal auditor and external auditor, we participated in that bid through BOCES, we can do it either way. We can do our own independent 
um, bid as well. I mean, we have a list of who we've gone out with when. I mean, that's how we just appointed our education consultants. Um, when it's a service, you can look at the pricing, but you can also look at other criteria depending on, on how that all looks as a package. To and if I remember correctly, on the architect one, we went out for bid, and I think we stayed with the same architecture firm because we found that they had the best response. So, I mean, doesn't mean you're changing it just means and, and you probably should do this on a regular basis anyway just to see what's out there and make sure we're the, doing the best for the district with whatever comes back I mean we, we may get one bid we may get 20 you know who knows so it's probably something that should be done on a regular basis anyway but we certainly have plenty of time it's a similar process to how we end up um, bringing forward with the athletic bids and I mean Tiffany does a number of bids all the time we have a spreadsheet with all the different what we participate with most is on what we do ourselves just to kind of keep a running tab on, on what those but are. as far as process maybe to answer Denise's question like we don't do anything it's done through generally Kim's office we get you know we get a summary of all the bids when they come back and then we decide how we want to move forward so it's really not much we do we just get so Right, so Other than make the decision based on the right. data that comes. We would get all the information on for professional services. You don't have to go with like the lowest bid. There's certain um, professionals that we work with that they there's certain criteria you may have, you may set as a board that you're looking for, but you don't have to go with like the lowest bid like when you're bidding on like parts and supplies and stuff. It's a little bit different. But for process wise I do have a question about that. So how, how does that work? Do we just decide now that we'd like to go out with an RFP or do we put that on the agenda for discussion at the next meeting? How does that work? You have to put it on the agenda for discussion at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Yes. So we'll take care of that then. Is there anything else for round table? So I make a motion to enter executive session to discuss contract negotiations. Can I have a second, please? Second, Denise. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 8-0.